I'm Ewa Messer. I'm the producer and host of Poured Over, and I have been a huge fan of Nicole Chung's for a really, really long time. So if I sound like I'm fangirling, I am. And <laughs> her first memoir, All You Can Ever Know, was a Discover Great New Writers pick back in the day when we did multiple selections several times a year kind of thing. And it was one of those books where everyone who was reading for the program said, oh, yeah, this one this one. And, you know, you don't always get consensus on every single title that goes in. So it was a really great moment. And you may know, if you know Nicole's story, that she's adopted, grew up in the Pacific Northwest. And here's the thing. The new memoir, A Living Remedy, is just out. And just when I thought Nicole had put everything into the world that she had, Here's a memoir that I think is going to wake a lot of people up. Nicole, it's so good to see you. It's great to see you, Mila. Thank you for doing this. Oh, please. An excuse to hang out with you? Are you kidding me? I just wish it were in person. It would be great if it were in person. <laughs> someday, someday we will get to do that again. Would you set up a living remedy? Because this, I knew what the book was when it was coming, but I think it's going to surprise some people. Yeah, of course. I mean, I should start off by saying this is really not the book I thought I would write. I sold it like right after All You Can Ever Know was published, actually. And um, as some people might know already, my father had passed away the year that book came out, um, several months before tour. So I went on book tour carrying this grief and it was a, you know, it's a strange experience. What I found I could not move past in my grieving process was just this deep anger. I felt really at the injustice of how he had died. Um, my father passed away at 67 of complications from diabetes and kidney failure. Like that's, that's the official story, but really, of course, it's like much more complicated than that because um, his death was really sped by years without access to the specialized medical care he needed. And, you know, that was caused by years of financial precarity and like life without health, health insurance. And I just kind of couldn't move past this. And I found I wanted to write about grief, yes, but also about how this had happened to my family, how it happens to so many families. It's such a common, like, American experience. Part of it was that I was, I was kind of revisiting grief stories and really appreciating them for what they were, but not seeing what I knew was my experience and what is the experience of so many other people, right? We don't face illness and the death and the suffering of loved ones with all the resources and support that we need. And so we are set up by these systems to feel as though we have failed or worse that our loved ones have failed um, when in fact these systems just aren't serving us because they're fundamentally broken. So that was the story I intended to write. And then after I sold the book and when I had started writing it, my mother was diagnosed with terminal cancer um, like a year after, year and a half after my father had passed and the whole landscape of the book had to shift. First, I put it down for a long time, but when I picked it back up again, I realized like her story was so important and was really going to be the foundation of the book, but it was still going to be a story also about like American instability and precarity and what happens when we aren't able to access the, the things that we need and yet still have to try to care for each other anyway, you know? Right. So that's the book. And again, it's not necessarily the one I expected to write. I'm really grateful to have had just such a supportive and patient uh, publishing team. Yeah, it was really a book that was conceived of and written and then kind of rewritten um, during the pandemic, no less. So it's been a journey. Uh, it's a lot. It's a lot to process. But, you know, I know I mentioned this to you before we started taping, but there are so many great lines in this book. The one that I'm sticking with right now is, if we were poor, wouldn't I have known? Mm -hmm. I knew the circumstances of your childhood as they were laid out obviously in the first memoir, but that line surprised me a little bit. Can we just talk about that piece of your background for a second? Because it's not something like it's yeah. there in the first book, but it's not there the way it is here. The first book, as you know, was so focused on adoption. And I remember um, when I was drafting All You Can Ever Know, people have asked me, was it hard to sift through those memories and decide what to include? And honestly, like, you know, like it, it, it wasn't because I would sort of hold up these memories and think, do people need to know this to understand what it was like growing up as an adoptee, to understand why I decided to search for my birth family? And I just, it wasn't writing my whole life story. And so it actually wasn't that difficult to sift through and choose the moments that were especially relevant to that very particular, very tightly focused adoption story. Like I had a chapter in that book about like leaving home 
and going off to school and the fact that I was like the first person in my family to go you know to college and get a bachelor's degree and it didn't fit in that book it wasn't like I was trying to hide it but like it did not fit in the book and it ended up being cut so the only important part about college in that book was like I was surrounded by Asian Americans for the first time in my life I was not the only Korean I knew for the first time at the time I was doing that, I had no idea I'd write another memoir, to be honest. I thought the first was probably it, but then like life happened. And in terms of that line that you mentioned, honestly, like it was terrifying as a writer to approach that aspect of the story. I still, like I remember going through marketing materials for the book and saying, I don't know if I feel comfortable claiming that I was poor, or grew up, you know, I don't know if I feel comfortable saying like we lived in poverty or my parents did and it, it's a strange thing to get hung up on like there were times I write about them having us having no income or no health insurance or like my mother selling plasma to like pay for my father's medication but at the same time you know when you're growing up there's so much that you don't see you are really as a child and a young adult you are learning about money you are learning about class and about your family's situation in the world, but it's often through what is not said to you, like you're trying to read the context and all of that. So I didn't have like language from my family to like define our experience. What I was trying to like assess in this book and like also at the time growing up was just, oh, look, I have this part-time job and I'm paying for like my lunches and my clothes and my college application fees. And like, it didn't even strike me at the time that that was abnormal or that not everyone I knew did that. I was just honestly doing what I thought had to be done because I was so focused on getting out of my hometown. And I didn't really start to look at things like through a different lens till I was away from home. And so I still, I don't know, I, I don't actually write in the book um, at any point that I felt like I was poor growing up because the truth is I didn't. And also I should note like my family situation, like so many families was, it's almost like a frog in a boiling pot of water situation where things happen so gradually. By the time things get really bad, you can't, you don't even really know when it started. You can't pinpoint the moment it got really bad, but like all of a sudden I'm talking to my mother about the choice between rent and groceries. You know, I think especially when you grow up as loved and as protected and as sheltered as I was in different ways, that type of thing, until it's like shoved in your face and made visible, you aren't always aware. And so a big part of the story is just about how we learn about money, about class, about our family situation, you know, throughout our lives. Yeah, family mythology is really powerful stuff. And there's so much shame and fear around money for a lot of people. And I think when you're really comfortable, it's hard to see that. It's hard to understand that, you know, it's really expensive to be poor. Hmm. Like the fees that you end up paying or like you don't have a bank account and you have to go to the check cashing place and stuff, like all of these things that, you know, quite a number of us will probably never experience. And so I think it's really important when we're having these conversations to recognize that there's such a range of experience. And I think that's part of what I appreciate so much in A Living Remedy is I didn't expect this book from you. And I think you really dig in hard and ask some questions that are difficult enough when you're just sitting in your living room and you're asking it in black and white for people who don't know you or your parents to read. It was really hard. I don't think I could have written this book five, 10 years ago. I think also I felt a lot of insecurity, to be honest, in writing it. I would kind of try and look at these moments head on, like from childhood or, or even like the final years of my father's life. And sometimes I would find myself wanting to back away or like issue these disclaimers, making it clear, like, I don't know, almost like it wasn't that bad or many people have it worse, you know? And I kept asking myself why that was. I just honestly never expected to tackle any of this in writing. And I, I don't know why. I don't know that I would have if it hadn't ended up playing such a huge role in my father's illness and death. I think too, we tend to think of stories from um, like from the working class. You know, I grew up very, but like, I think I was worried people would think, well, this isn't the type of experience we expect to hear from you individually. We, we don't hear a lot about it from like, we're not enough about it from like non-white writers. And I was just kind of worried about just like so many things. It was just a very scary process. 
at the same time, I saw no way to tell the story without it. It's obviously a really important piece. It was definitely like a process of figuring out, and this is always the case with memoir, no matter what type, like what really is most important? What do readers need to know to care? Like I'm not telling, you can't tell the entire story. Right. But like how do I give them enough that they understand like how complex it, it was and, and what this experience was like and and help them relate it to their own lives if you know if they can. It was a really daunting task, honestly. You've said a couple of times in different interviews that you wonder if being an adoptee is what made you settle on being a writer. And your parents were always very, very supportive of your desire to be a writer, which I love that part of it. And, you know, you're talking about Anne of Green Gables with your mom and Pride and Prejudice. I, it's it's a very sweet moment early in the new book. But I mean, is that the case? Like, are, did you notice more because you were sort of, I guess, a perpetual outsider, even though you weren't? I mean, you were surrounded by love and family and taking care. How do you navigate that space? Yeah, I mean, so for, for listeners who like aren't familiar, maybe with the first book, I grew up in a very sheltered, overwhelmingly white southern oregon town um like i was literally the only korean i knew until i went to college and so it was like total racial isolation and balancing that yeah with, with, with what you're saying i was always cared for my parents made sure for the most part i had what i needed and i had a lot of love and support like in my life i think i did grow up very watchful uh just because i was used to being in spaces and trying to tell and you probably know what this is like a little bit just like am i Am I like welcome here? Am I accepted here? Like, can I be here or do I have to be on guard the whole time? You know, um, who are my allies? Who do I have to look out for? I don't mean to sound paranoid, but like, this is what it was like navigating. I was always in an all white space until I left home. And I think that breeds in, in some people, at least in me, like a certain watchfulness, a certain awareness. So, and I was obsessed. I write this in the book, but like, I was like, what's normal? Like, what is like, again, and by normal, I just meant ex expected and accepted who gets to exist here without being questioned i was always really curious about those things and so yeah i, I was just a kid who noticed stuff and then also maybe it's partly generational right like i grew up with working parents and i was an only child and i was on my own a lot i was a latchkey kid like <laughs> there was a lot of time to sit and think and write um and which my family was really supportive of um so i don't know i think that's that's part of it I didn't think of it at the time as like a super, a super creative childhood, but I think I was always like encouraged to not just notice things, but to think and talk about and ask questions about those things. And my parents and I had very different ideological, you know, political views, but mm -hmm. discussion was never discouraged in my household and reading was never discouraged, like any type. And so I think those two things meant we had a lot of conversations. And also you did keep daily journals. I mean, that's a pretty disciplined thing especially for a young person. I mean, I luckily keep my calendar on the computer, but it's certainly not a work of art. It's just more a matter of this is where you have to be and when you have to be there. What's it like, though, going back and looking at 13-year-old Nicole's thoughts? Nonstop cringe fest is what that <laughs> I don't look back at my old journals very much unless I'm trying to like write about a time period. And I didn't actually have them all until after my mother's death, like uh, boxes started arriving from her house and like in them were some of my childhood journals. And then starting in high school, they were like in a word document. So like I have, I have like electronic files. It turned out to be like great sources, <laughs> but like not that I was thinking about that at the time, but yeah, I've journaled like pretty steadily, maybe not daily, but very steadily since I was like six. I mean, I've been really glad to have those, obviously, and this will sound cliche, but it is very much like like reading the journal of a completely different person. I don't know. I'm struck by like how hopeful I was. Yeah. You asked like at 13, I think actually I was fairly hopeful at times, very goal oriented. But at the same time, like sometimes there's this undercurrent I can't deny of like real anxiety and sometimes anger, you know, I think. And like trying to figure out, like I mentioned before, all the things that weren't being said in my family or in my community, I'm trying to figure out what all that meant. I feel like there was so much that my family tried to protect me from knowing, and it just left me with a lot of questions and like sometimes really deep anxiety as a kid. So what are some of those things that they weren't talking about that you were able to actually identify and, and yeah. put in the book? 
Early on, I write about the first time my mother had cancer. She was diagnosed with breast cancer when I was a freshman in high school. And I remember we did not talk about it. I mean, except to be told that it was happening and she was having surgery and then hooray, she's okay and it's in remission. Like there was no like real discussion. I didn't really realize how afraid and like traumatized I was by this until Mm -hmm. like years later. And I once asked her like, Like, why didn't we talk about it? We talked about a lot of other things. Like we weren't weren't like a family that kept quiet about everything, Um, just very certain things. But, you know, she was just like, I don't have to talk about it. Like I lived through it. I just remember thinking like, I don't know how to process this because it did happen to her in a way and not to me. But as a kid, I would have had no way of figuring that out or dealing with my feelings about it other than talking. So like, that's one example. And I would say like, anytime there was a health emergency, in the family, I would find out when things got too big to hide. Like, I didn't know my mother was having a lot of pain until, like, a night I drove her to the ER, you know? And and that was, like, very typical. And I think a lot of that came from them wanting to protect me. I just felt like all I could do was react sometimes to whatever crisis was happening. It also sounds like there was a level of baseline anxiety for you. I mean, at one point, your mother was like, Nicole, you're going to give yourself an ulcer. Your mom said this. I know. I know. You obviously knew a lot more than you were letting yourself recognize. I mean, and compartmentalization, all teenagers, <laughs> most teenagers, I should right. say, do this. And But that kind of blew my mind where your mom was just like, no, I know what you're doing. I see what you're doing. And yet she was doing the exact same thing to you. Like, where did you learn it from? It's pretty obvious where you learned it from. It's true. It's true. My mother was like, I mean, one of the most anxious people I've known. What's strange is that she, um, she was always convinced I would be okay. Like, I think she just couldn't imagine a world in which I wasn't or like refused to. And so even though she was very anxious, it did not usually extend to like me, my health, like my situation. She was like, I'm going to be fine. Like you know, she was very religious too. So she was always like, you know, I've prayed about this. It's handled. And that's obviously, that was not always reassuring to me. But the the ulcer line, she, she really believed I put way too much pressure on myself um, in high school trying to, like, I knew I wasn't going to college without scholarships. I didn't know how college worked. There weren't a lot of people in my life I could talk to, like, about it. And so, I don't know. I just remember, like, pushing myself really hard because it seemed like that was going to be my only chance, like, to leave my very white hometown, but also hopefully do something with my life and be able to help my family. She didn't want any of that to be like my burden. It was just very much like, well, is this going to make you happy? And I got to say, like, that's not how I thought about life as a teenager. Like, what's going to bring me bliss? Somehow, like, their study, like, support and encouragement still allowed me, I guess, I don't know what you, like, maybe the confidence or just the like the courage to try to chase the life I wanted eventually. But yeah, she, she definitely like, it's so strange to me, like that balance of like, my mother worries about everything. My mother is sure that I'll be fine. Like, <laughs> I don't know where that comes from. Do you do that with your kids too? You have a couple of kids who are adults. Yeah, I worry about them, I think more um, than my mom perhaps worried about me. I do have a little bit of her, like I think, One thing I write about in the book, too, just briefly, is, like, I think she gave me an understanding of, like, the idea of what, of okay. Like, I remember when when I first had my kids, I had this pretty narrow view, which I think is common, of, like, what their life will look like, like, all, and by that I don't mean, like, what they're going to do with their life or, like, who they're going to love or anything. I mean, like, they're going to have the things they need. They're going to get an education. They're going to, like, go to college and have a life that they love, you know, basic things like that. The further you get into parenting, I think the more you just accept that there's no guarantees and there's, there's no control. And I am also actually pretty convinced my kids, both of them are going to be okay, but it's just like a long time coming to realize that okay can look like a lot of different things. Um, And one person's okay might, you know, be very different from another person's. I have my younger daughter's autistic and need a lot of support. And it's been just kind of an ongoing process of realizing like, you know, can try to get her all the support that we can. And also we don't really know what's going to happen because you never do with any child. And no matter what, I do believe that she's going to be okay. It's just, I think my definition of that has really expanded. Yeah. I mean, one of the things, this brings me to something you say in the book, 
that also sort of made my eyes get really big, which is, you know, we talk about death being one of the great equalizers, right? It's an experience that no matter what your financial situation is or who you are or what your background is, everyone experiences this. And yet that's not entirely, I mean, yes, in a very basic sense, yes, everyone experiences death, but what happens after death? And in terms of, you know, financial burdens and all of this kind of experience. And I really do want to talk about the systemic stuff for a second, because your family, they just sound like terrific people, your parents and your kids and everyone else. But your experience of money is very different from your parents. Your husband's experience of money is really different from yours. All of this comes together. And yet you're all part of the same system and it affects everyone very differently. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think figuring out how to write this was, was challenging for me because I grew up in a family where we did not really talk about money. Like uh, I didn't have any idea, for instance, what my family made or like how little honestly we made until I saw my first FAFSA filled out. And it was like so much less than my freshman year cost. And I like our, our, expect, our expected family contribution was zero because it was like tens of thousands of dollars less than my freshman year. And I had no idea. Like I had grown up in this household with fairly open parents, but like we didn't talk about money. It was one of the things they were really private about. Probably a mix of not wanting me to worry and thinking, honestly, it's none of your business, which isn't wrong in a way. And then moving into the world and figuring out like, oh, a lot of people who are very different, grew up in very different circumstances than mine, like they also maybe don't want to talk about money in a really open way. And I just didn't know how to navigate any of that. I feel like I'm still sort of learning. Um, Because in my view, I'm like, well, you have money. Why would you be embarrassed talking about it? (laughs) Like, it just, I don't know. It feels to me, growing up with parents, who I think sometimes were, I don't don't think they were ashamed, but I think they, they were always stressed. And some of their hesitation around discussing finances was the fact that we just didn't really have enough. And so my feeling was like, well, like, if you have enough, what's the problem? Like, why not talk about these things? That's, of course, not how everybody feels. (laughs) So striking a balance, too, between trying to be honest about where we were, but maybe not naming specific numbers. I don't know. It was like kind of a negotiation with myself of like, you know, people need to understand sort of what the circumstances were, but the actual number also isn't that important. It's, It's kind of like, I mean, it is and it isn't. But the important thing is the experience, like the results. Right. Yeah. I mean, you'd also talk about leaving for college and leaving this tiny, tiny, tiny town where you were the only Asian person for miles. But you talk about college being the start of an act of assimilation. And I think a lot of folks, when they think of assimilation, they're thinking of recent immigrant. They're thinking of maybe a POC trying to be more white, for example, like all of these different things. But Class is also a matter of assimilation for some folks. And I thought that was really interesting that you chose that particular phrase because you didn't even know it at the time. You were just like, now that I look back, okay, I see it. But what was that experience like for you landing, not just in a community where there were finally other Asian Americans, Korean Americans, you know, Taiwanese, Chinese, Japanese, but really in a situation where, you know, you suddenly had classmates who were probably a little more comfortable than you or had different experiences because their parents had more capital than yours. Yeah. I mean, I would say, again, it wasn't something we talked about a lot in college and many of my students, probably fellow students were probably like as ignorant as I was of their family's actual finances. You know, I would see it again. It's all about like between the lines, like my sweet mate comes back with like 10 Armani Express shopping bags, or we are going out to celebrate like our, we did like a secret Santa gift exchange at the holidays. And like, everyone's like, oh, we shouldn't spend a lot. Let's just spend like 50 bucks per person. I'm like, I don't have 50 bucks in my bank account at this point in the semester. I was always like um, overdrawing my college account. Like I just didn't have enough. That was how it kind of showed up. And like, at the same time, like, it's not like college is an equalizer. I mean, especially at an elite institution, but like we all lived in the same place. I did feel like I fit in for the most part. I didn't feel super self-conscious like about the class differences, I don't think. Um, But I did start to like notice like people's surprise to hear I have like some work study jobs and like growing up in Oregon, I don't know how to explain this to people who are not from like Oregon and in particular like small town Oregon, but like I had rich friends growing up with like swimming pools and like ski vacations. But like where I grew up, rich people dressed and acted and talked just like the rest of us. And I think 
I don't know. I just think it was different, like coming out here to the East Coast, com coming to college. In terms of the racial aspect, like I, I don't know. In a way, college was the first place where it didn't feel so relevant because I was not the only one in the room. To be clear, I did have a couple Asian friends growing up. I didn't know any any other Koreans. You know, it's just like I'm talking like I had like two Asian friends <laughs> ever my whole childhood. So yeah, I mean, when I wrote my first book, even I thought oh, the reason college was important for me was because, like, I went to a school as 25% Asian and Asian American and, like, saw faces like mine and developed actual friendships with fellow Koreans and Asians. And, like, that was great. And I didn't really think about, I wasn't thinking about the class aspect, but until I started to write this book and sometime between my freshman year and my graduation, like, my parents and I are just were in completely different worlds. The thing is, I think they knew that might happen. I think they knew that like in a way they were letting me go into this place they couldn't follow, but I had no idea that's what leaving meant. And it's really only looking back that I've seen it. In theory, that is their jobs, right? To make sure that we can do whatever's next. And in theory, whatever's next isn't necessarily the thing that just happened in the generation above us. And I think it's easy to take that kind of mobility for granted in a lot of ways. And then there are times where you're just like, how did I get here? And there's a lot of you reckoning with, how did I get here? Yeah. And also like how much longer it took than I thought it would, especially yeah. because I chose to pursue a career in editing and writing and publishing. I remember like my parents were so convinced the degree itself is like, it's going to be your calling card. It doesn't, they didn't even care what it was in. Like nobody blinked when I was like, I think I'll be a history major. I think I'll take a lot of English classes. <laughs> like they were like, great, fine, whatever. It's like to them, it was like the degree is what's important. That's what's going to let you sustain yourself because they didn't have one. And so they thought that's what would happen. And of course, like it takes time. I And I remember thinking I was still buying into this sort of bootstrapping myth of like, I will work hard and pay my dues. And then I will be able to be, like help my family in the way they need. just bide your time, be patient and like, of course, like my family, like so many families, like we just didn't have that time. And I didn't know it. Like I've been incredibly fortunate. I have a lot of class and educational privilege, but I did not have the kind of money like that my parents needed at the time they needed it. Like I could not pay for my father's health care. Like I couldn't pay for all his prescriptions out of pocket. I was able to help my mother like a lot more than my father. And that was mostly because of like book royalties from the first book. So I don't want to act like I was struggling the whole time, but stability has come kind of kind of late, later than I expected. Um, and I'm still one of the very, very lucky ones, but it just wasn't in time for me to help my dad. And I'm always going to have to live with that. I mean, what's kind of fascinating for me too is now seeing all of these conversations that we're trying to have, you know, who can afford a house, who can't? Who can afford school, who can't? It's, um, we've sort of lost that idea of helping people move forward, right? Or move in a different direction or get ahead. It's just kind of like, well, you know, we did it. You should just be able to. And it's like, well, no, actually you pulled up the ladder behind you and there's no space for anyone else. And it's just, it's kind of wild. We're also so obsessed with like the idea of who deserves it. And who oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like, are you, I'm sorry, but are you the kind of person who deserves yeah. A little helping hand or not and you know what type of people do we do we think really deserve that and um and then too if you even if you are one of the very very lucky ones who kind of slips through then it's like well then they want to turn your story into some kind of like performative american dream story like the temptation to do that is so great and i honestly like if i if i didn't have like the the really supportive like publishing team that I have, for example, like I wonder, okay, like I'm a, I'm an Asian American, I'm a working class person of color, like working from that background. Like there could be a lot of pressure to try to turn my story into something like that, which could then be used like to attack people who haven't been as fortunate, right? Um, or who they don't think are as deserving. And I really reject like those narratives, but I know, I know how popular they are and they're popular in this country for a reason. Right. And it's because of what you're saying. We're like obsessed with the idea that the meritocracy is real and that if you're deserving enough, you'll get where you're supposed to be. And also that this is an opportunity, conversely, that is open to everybody when it is not. So, yeah. Deserving is such a gross word. I know. So I know. Gross. I mean, this so is gross. Like, <laughs> I know. And people will also always say it as a compliment. 
like, oh, that's yeah. so deserved. And I know what they mean. Like, I, I understand they don't mean it that way, but I always kind of recoil a bit, like, because what does that really mean? I don't know. Yeah, deserving and also one of the good ones, like that just, that, oh. that, that swings way more towards repulsive than gross. But, you know, the language that we use to talk about all of this stuff and, and experience and, you know, how we move forward, I just, I think what you've done in this book is pretty cool. But I'm also not particularly surprised that you got to this book. I know we've been talking about, you know, sort of the, the fear that came out of it a bit and whatnot, but you've been pretty upfront about your life for a really long time. I mean, you were the managing editor at The Toast and you were the editor in chief of, the, of Catapults magazine. And you've been publishing this work on your own and other people's voices as well for a long time. And I love that honesty, but how did you get from your BA to <laughs> the editing and writing and everything else? Because that's not always how it works. Yeah. I mean, I don't even know how to describe it. It's everyone has, then again, like I will say almost everybody I know who does what I do has a very strange, like twisting path to it uh, with a lot of surprises along the way. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I'm not trying to be like self-deprecating, but I do think a lot of it in my case was like, a lot of it was luck sometimes, the right opportunity at the right time. My first editing job was with The Toast you mentioned, and I was in a position where I could take what was at the time a really low paying editorial job um, because I was also in grad school at the time and the primary caregiver to like two very young children. It was going to be so hard to work a full-time job anyway, or to right. work like I just needed something that was flexible and that would give me editorial experience. So like a lot of people probably couldn't have taken that job. It didn't have health insurance. It started part-time before moving to full-time. But like for me, it ended up being like a, a, like the right opportunity at the right time. Um, so I did that for two years and like I, I went to Catapult after um, and yeah, a moment of silence for Catapult magazine. But that was obviously like a really wonderful experience too. You know, I wasn't making much money at that point in my career either. And at that point, I'm kind of mid-career. So there was a lot of like privilege involved in being able to take those roles. Like I, I will always kind of have some feelings or some, like I wonder, could I have helped my family more if I weren't trying to be an editor in indie media and publishing? Like, yes, probably I could have been of more use. Um, but I also feel like in a way, I was really lucky to get to do those jobs, to take them on and to have like institutional support at times I needed it and to be given like editorial freedom when I wanted it. And I know those are precious things. They're so precious. Those places don't exist anymore. Right. So like, I don't, I don't regret that time, but it was very, there were choices that were made. Um, I'm sure I could have been doing something more lucrative. And then I've always freelanced like all along. And so right now, like I'm a full-time freelancer and I freelance for different publications, but that too feels really tenuous. Like I want to stress again, I know it's a luxury in a way, but I don't know how long I can afford to be a freelancer. It's, it's been like good in a lot of ways for me creatively, but I, what I always say is like writing supports me right now. And I don't know if it will a year from now. And that's truly like just what it's like. And there's a whole nother conversation that we're not going to have right now about AI and robots. Oh God. oh God. We're not no. going to have that conversation right now. And I mean, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> hey guys, I've been hearing so much about it. It's deeply depressing. That's a whole different conversation. And also, frankly, someone could create an entire podcast series about the American dream and what it means at different points in different places, because it's not that simple. <laughs> it's just not that simple. But I want to stick with you as a writer for a second, because you and I have talked about some of your influences in the past just over lunch, but let's do it on the record. Let's do it on the show. Can we talk about some of your literary influences and, and how we got to where we are now with you as a writer? Yeah, I mean, I have like favorite, favorite writers and like um, books that have meant a lot to me. I will say part of being like a Korean American adoptee, like, is that I've never really had great comps. <laughs> For the first book, I had almost none, I think. And for the second book, the first book was the comp. Yep. <laughs> and so I won't say that means I haven't been influenced by people. Like, of course right. I have. But it's just, like, I've always been really aware that, and this is true of so many writers, it's not just me, but, like, my whole career has been about sort of doing something, like, different. Yeah. Uh, trying to make my own way, which I know is is the case for many writers. But no, favorite, I mean, people who whose work have, has just meant a lot to me. like. I mean, you mentioned already some of the books I grew up with, right. but like books that made me fall in love with literature. I mean, it was like 
cliche, but Jane Austen. And in terms of like recent books, I like more recent, like favorite essayists. I love Alexander Chee's book, How to Write an Autobiographical Novel. I actually read that every time I have writer's block. Just like, it's sort of like, it does what reading poetry does for me. It kind of okay. shifts out of it. Yeah, I love Julie Otsuka. Like, so her book, The Swimmers, I mean, oh. all her books. But like this past year, just like, and I read The Swimmers as I was, like, I just finished writing my book. But, you know, the storyline with yep. the, with Alice, the mother in the book, it was just like such a poignant story to be reading at that time. Of course, like the books are completely different, but I was just so moved and I'm amazed at the way she mm-hmm. plays with form and narrative and structure. I just, it's just such a deeply human book. Mm-hmm. And it was like what I needed to read at the time. Yeah, there's like, there's like so many, I don't know. I read a lot of poetry mm-hmm. actually. And it's kind of what I go to when I'm stuck as well. Mm-hmm. It's just hard. Like I feel as though I read and love a lot of writers. I don't know that I'm like influenced by them. And when it comes to mm-hmm. memoir specifically, actually when I'm writing memoir, I don't read it. Like I'm yeah. trying to keep it yeah. other people's memoir voices out of my head. Mm-hmm. I'll, read, I'll read a lot of fiction and I'll read poetry, but I usually take a break if I'm working on like personal stories of my own. But now that this book is like done, like in the can, I feel like, okay, I'll start like really looking, looking at memoir again. Yeah. After you finish your book tour. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I'm going to need books to read on book tour. So yeah. There's that, but I mean, you get to go wander the stacks all over the country, yeah. so that's kind of great. Yeah. But the other thing is, too, Julio Tsuka's Swimmers, I'm so glad you mentioned that book, because it does, it sits in conversation with A Living Remedy. I mean, the way you both talk about grief and the way you both talk about parenting and our experience of parenting um, and being parented, yeah, the books sit in conversation. They really do sit in conversation, and I think um, also, I mean, Julie, God, if we could all write as tightly as Julie does. Yeah. I mean, come on. 159 pages of perfect is yeah. swimmers. And I don't usually describe books as being perfect, but that one really, it does so much in such a tiny space. And I have to say, you do a similar thing. A Living Remedy is not a terrifically long book, but yeah. it, it's expansive and it has a big heart. Thank you. I mean, I um, I think it clocked in at like 60, maybe 63, 64,000 words. Mm-hmm. So it's shorter than my first. And when I got the final copy, I was surprised. I'm like, it looks longer than it is. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I, it was funny, like, because I definitely wrote like 80 some thousand words and like a bunch of the revisions were just aimed at like trimming the fat. Mm-hmm. And I had a friend I would text today, like, I'm like, I just cut like another thousand words. And she's like, is it going to be a 10 page book? Like, tell me it's not going to be a 10 page book. But back to the swimmers real quick. Yeah. I said, like, I think what what, I, what really moved me most from that book, actually, you know, obviously the grief and parenting and being mm-hmm. parented stuff, but like the sense of regret and time you don't get back with loved ones and the choices you make that take you far from them. And just like how you live with those, it doesn't necessarily mean they were the wrong decisions. You know, it's, life is not that simple, but like you still have to live with the fallout. And I found a lot of those sections to be the most moving, like the parts about the, when the daughter is the narrator about like leaving and she writes at one point like you broke your mother's heart and like it, it wasn't like it didn't seem like a big dramatic severing right it just seemed like life like choices taking her farther so yeah yeah but again I just keep coming back to the fact that I think well at least in my experience my parents were fully prepared for me to do whatever I was going they may not have been thrilled but they knew it was going to happen I don't think that was necessarily their plan <laughs> but yeah they- I- I think I was raised like to not look back because that was, and I read about this too, like that was the example my parents set for me. Like they, they grew up in Ohio and left everything and everyone they knew. And they were like the pioneers of their family. You know, we were the only ones out on the West coast. They lived in Alaska for a while. Like they were, and like where other people would have seen like, I don't know what the people would have been scared. Even my adoption in a way, they approached it as like, just head on. Like, this is what we're meant to do. We're going to do it. I don't know. Like they never told me this is how you live a life. This is how you leave home. But I still had that like model. Like when I thought about their history and like thought about their story, that's the pattern they gave me is like, you do, you make these choices and then you live with them. It doesn't mean you're guaranteed like a great ending, but that's what it means. Um, They didn't really raise me to be cautious or to try to protect myself. And I am really grateful for that. Family mythology is wild. It's complete. It is the wildest thing I was just recently with some cousins and we were comparing notes and not everyone has the same version of a story. (laughs) Yeah. 
it's wild. It's completely wild. So, you know, the idea that my parents could have been surprised by anything is <clears throat> pretty entertaining to me, but okay. People were like shocked that my family was so supportive of me going to college on the opposite side of the country. Mm -hmm. and, they're only, and, and, you know, some people knew that like my parents didn't have college degrees. So right. but, like I had friends whose parents wouldn't let them look at like out of state schools. And I don't know, I was just, that, that was never a question. It was like, you know, go, it's your life. You're going to go where you want and do what you want. And they wouldn't have dreamed of like trying to kind of keep me back from that. At the same time, I do think sometimes they were surprised. <laughs> At choice. And they never understood my career. Like they didn't understand the writing entirely, but they really didn't understand the editing. And so sometimes they would think it was volunteer work. Like they'd get confused. I'm like, no, no, this is this is actually my day job. I, I get why you think it's volunteer. It's not super well paid. But um, you know, or they would they would think it was like a hobby. Like, and I was never really able to explain like my my like career in publishing to them so when they were surprised it was usually surprised and like accepting which I'm grateful for how did writing a living remedy change you I think it's more that I had to change to write it okay okay so like until this book I'd never missed a, a deadline <laughs> and like I'll just tell you we moved it like twice I mean part of it was pandemic and my mother passing away in the early weeks of the pandemic but I really had to become a different writer I think to write this and by that, I mostly mean I couldn't treat myself like a machine, which I swear I didn't realize I was doing like essentially my entire life. Um, now that I think about it, it's wild that like the day after my father died, I sat down and I hit a manuscript deadline and turned that manuscript in. But like, that's just what I did. That's what I always thought I had to do. It's like my humanity and caring for myself like comes after I get all my, sh my stuff done. No, but like that's, that's like always who I, who I was. And I actually had like a twisted pride in like the fact that, well, I can always work. I can always be productive. I'm always going to get my stuff done. You can count on me. And this book, it just wouldn't have worked. Like I could have forced myself to keep my butt in my chair and like write on days when I was grieving, deeply depressed, trying to parent like kids who are not totally okay during a pandemic, you know, trying to balance work and school Zooms. I could have like just kind of pushed through and, but I, it wouldn't have been a good book. It wouldn't have been a book I was proud of. I don't think it would have been the book it needed to be. And so just learning to show myself like a little bit of grace, which I'm still, I'm still learning and recognize like, oh, if I can't write today, like maybe that is okay. Maybe I'll write tomorrow. It sounds so basic. It was just not, something I'd ever done for myself before. And like, honestly, I, I left Catapult mostly because I realized I couldn't work a full-time job editing and finish this book. And like, I loved my work there and my team, but when push came to shove, I was like, well, I am going to have to choose at this point. Um, instead of trying to do both and like running myself absolutely ragged, like that too was a decision I made to try to, yes, finish this book, but also recognize that I'm human and like take care of myself. I had to like really shift how I thought about, about myself, my work, my, my self-worth to write this. And I don't mean to sound like really woo, but it, I couldn't have written the book like without, without that shift. I felt it was a hard book to write. Like sometimes I would cry writing, which doesn't happen to me usually, but I also felt really free writing it. I felt like I gave myself permission like to bring everything I am to this book. And like, I'll be honest, I, I brought a lot to my first book, but I don't know if I was quite this free. Like I had that sort of debut experience as a writer of color and as an adoptee of like, I don't know, I didn't feel as free as I did with this book. So I'm really thankful for this writing experience. That seems like a really good place to end the show. I was going to throw in a question about Peggy, but oh, people can meet Peggy when they read because the, I like following Peggy, but um, they can find out who Peggy is when they pick up the book, don't you think? Yeah, I think if they follow me on any platform also, they will. They, they will. People know about Peggy. Right, <laughs> <laughs> Nicole Chung, thank you so, so much. A Living Remedy is out now, and if you haven't read All You Can Ever Know, well, you should get that too. Thank you so much, Mila. This was wonderful. Hello, readers. It's time for another TBR Top Off. We're going to recommend a couple of wonderful books to pick up when you stop in for your copy of A Living Remedy. 
I'm Mark coming to you from my Barnes & Noble in Cincinnati, and I'm joined by my favorite book buddy, Madison. Hello, Madison. Hello, I'm Madison, joining you from my store in Los Angeles. So we're going to jump right in. Madison, why don't you go ahead and kick us off? So when I was thinking about books to recommend, I went to my roots and brought in Indiana native Don Green. He and his nonfiction, The Anthropocene Reviewed. I chose this book because, one, he is a fellow podcaster, and this book are all of his essays that have been adapted and expanded from his podcast. And in this, he goes into more greater detail about like the different topics he's talked about. In the book, he talks about COVID and the pandemic, which I think is so timely. We were all there in that pandemic. It's still fresh for all of us. Seeing how people went through it, how others went through it, and like reading how like what he did, how he went through it, it's just very comforting in a way. Like when you're like stuck at home and you need something to read, you're like, okay, I'm not alone. And I think nowadays in literature, now that more and more people are talking about like the pandemic and relating to it, kind of being like, all right, so it like really wasn't the best time for any of us and we're not alone and it's okay to feel that way. But there's also so many other diverse topics he talks about. He goes on from like Haley's Comet, Penguins of Madagascar. He talks about conversations he has with his brother. Like to me, I find John Green and his writing so relatable. He also gives so much rich detail in his writing. So it's definitely not like surface level. I think you can see that in his fiction. You can see it in his nonfiction as well. He's just a relatable character. And the way he ties everything together, going from talking to one completely random topic to the next, but somehow it connects. I think that's a really powerful way to write and not every author can do it. And the favorite part of this book is the ending. It is definitely an ending that gives goosebumps. I don't want to give it away. I want you to feel those goosebumps for yourself. But that is why I recommended the Anthropocene Reviewed by John Green. So good. I went with a title that has been giving me some feels lately. I read it a while back and I'm still kind of thinking about it and mulling it over. That is Seeing Ghosts by Kat Chow. It is a memoir of family and of grief. Uh, it's told beautifully and tenderly. It's giving me crying in H Mart kind of vibes in the best possible way. Not a something to as a knockoff, but just as sort of a, something complimentary. It's gorgeous. Um, so Kat Chow's mother had recently died from cancer. Her father and her two sisters are obviously, of course, very grief stricken. But eventually Kat's journalistic mind and her lovely, lovely, curious heart embark on this excavation of her family's past and their present. And it allows for this very beautifully lit pathway to their future. I would love the way that Chow's writing feels slightly obscured. I think Seeing Ghosts is a perfect title for this book. The way that she recounts her mother's past feels like her, her mother's ghost is just whispering small things into her ear. There's a lot of supposition that feels very potent and very honest. Kat doesn't have all the answers about her mother's past and her the way her mother felt about things. So you have to kind of fill in some of these blanks. And she does this in a way that I've not really seen before in a memoir. I just think it's so, so perfect. We see her mother's journey as a Chinese American immigrant, her very uncharacteristic, but charming playfulness. Her mother was somebody who I just really think I would have loved to have met her. She is fun and funny in a way that a lot of Chinese mothers are not. And she's just able to slip these kind of almost jokey, wonderful things into Kat's life and her family's life and infuse it with this certain level of love that I didn't expect. And I don't think Kat's really expected either. It also talks about her immense impact on Chow's family, the then, the now, and then the going forward. Uh, her mother's influence will always be felt in this family. And I think it's just this rich and lovely and brief, but very, very powerful story about a family. And through Kat's writing, I think 
readers will be astounded. It's, I think, a must read. Please pick up Seeing Ghosts by Kat Chow. That is all we have for today. Thank you so much for tuning in to Port Over. Please make sure to give us a rating and subscribe so you never miss an episode. You can also follow us on our socials at Barnes & Noble. I'm Mark. You can follow my home store at BN Westchester. And I'm Madison. You can follow my home store at BN Events Grove. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Happy reading. Bye. Happy reading. Bye. Thank you for listening. Poured Over is a Barnes & Noble production. To help other readers find us, please rate and review the show wherever you listen to podcasts.